my name is Jake Blecka, and I'm going to be walking you through how to build a module from scratch and why it's helpful to you and your fellow coworkers. One of the things that a lot of my coworkers ask me about is why I create modules as opposed to just building a single script for them. And the reason that I uh, do a module in general is because it's easier to transfer to other people than just a single module. Uh, script file. I can send a lot more information across. I can build classes and functions that work with each other. And they get all of that information together rather than just a single script, which may or may not include everything that they need. Uh, one of the other things is it, it provides an excellent amount of versioning within the module so that you can replace versions of the module with newer ones. And if you have an issue with a newer version of the module, you can uninstall that version of the module while leaving the older versions in place. So you have an ability to back out a change when you've put something into production and it did not work exactly according to plan. One of the other nice things is you can actually specify other modules that are necessary for your module to run. So if your module relies on the Azure Active Directory module to be installed, you can specify that within the module manifest and it keeps people from running your module without having that module installed that is necessary to do the work. What I'm going to talk about first are kind of the important module pieces uh, that you need to have in order to make a module work really well. Uh, and the first thing you need is you need a directory. So you actually have to have that directory in place in order for PS uh, get and the NuGet modules to work on publishing your module and taking that module and bundling it all up together. So you actually have to create a directory that is named the same name as your module. We'll go through this in a demo later on and I'll show you that information. The next important thing is the module manifest file. It contains all the information about the module, its version, who wrote it, companies, the other required modules, and any other information that's really pertinent to that module itself. If you look at Microsoft's website, they have a new module manifest commandlet, which actually has all the parameters you need to create your module manifest. So uh, the path where you're going to output it, the nested modules, a GUID, an author, a company name. These are all the things that keep your module separate from other modules within systems and easy to update. So if you change the name of your module and you change the version, but it's got the same GUID, it'll automatically update and say, hey, this is the newer one, this is the replacement for it, and it'll keep that all in line. So those are the important things uh, from the new module manifest. And like I said, we'll go through a demo of what's actually in a module manifest, uh, cooking show style in a few minutes. The other thing that's important is the PSM file, the PSM1 file. This is normally where you would put every single function that you want to use, or class, enumeration, any of those things. You would want to put all of that stuff into that file. And if you're like me, having one single file that has all of your functions and all of your stuff in it can get a little crazy when you start going about doing like find and replaces on large amounts of things, and it can get kind of hairy because you, you don't know which you know, which variables are being used where, and you may end up making a change somewhere down the line that might be, you know, kind of uh, a bit crazy. So I, uh, I, what I actually do is I create a scripts directory underneath my module that then I use the PSM1 to load all of the functions from that scripts directory. And then I don't have to worry about overwriting something on accident, typing something wrong in one of the the mod or one of the functions I'm not working on and it's a little less confusing on the code. It's a little bit easier for, you know, you to isolate out different portions of it. And if you're working with something like Git or you're working with any other versioning tools, it really does make it harder or easier for you to make your changes to a single file and keep them all in line, even though Git is pretty good, it keeps it all nicely in line and lets you know exactly which files are changing where and which functions have changed, etc. So that's one of the benefits of doing a module and doing a separated scripts folder within that module to contain all your scripts. 
one of the other things that I do is I also separate all my classes out into their own class files. And depending on what I'm working on, I may actually make multiple class files that contain that class information. So if I'm working on an API that has a lot of different data that's coming in, a lot of different class information, you know, customer information, order information, uh, the part information. What I do is I build class files for each one of those things so they don't overlap and it's easier for us to find. I do use a VS Code a lot and VS Code is very good about separating things out, but it's still sometimes just nice to have that physical separation or virtual separation rather of those files. And another thing that's also important is a class format file for those classes. If you really want your module to look good, look sleek and nice, you really want to put in an IP or a class format file that is an XML file that defines how those uh, pieces of data get shown on the screen when you return that information to the user. So those are the primary uh, files and structure that you need in order to get a module going. We're going to do this little cooking show style. I've got a pre-built module that will go through each of the pieces and kind of look at those things and in a little more detail. So this is my VS Code editor, and I have the PowerShell uh, integrated console set up as well in the cons in uh, VS Code. It's been tuned a little bit uh, to my likes, but this is pretty much the standard out of the box that you get for uh, the PowerShell tools within VS Code. And you'll notice over on the left, I have my folder structure here. And I've got my PSIP tools, which is the name of my module. I, I built some IP tools because, you know, sometimes it's really annoying to calculate a subnet mask and uh, CIDR information. So I figured this would be a good little treat to start with. So the first important thing is this directory itself is set up and it's named PSIP tools, which is the exact name of my module. This is important because if these do not match, when you go to publish this module, it will not publish correctly. And of course, because this is a live demo, it's not going to publish correctly no matter what I do. But anyways, <laughs> the next important file is the PSD1 file. And like I said before, this PSD1 file can be created by using the new module manifest commandlet. You can also copy and paste one from another module and then just change the appropriate things within it. Uh, in here, each uh, section here, uh, each key and pair, a key and value pair, is going to be, say, your root module, which is going to be our PSM1 that we load all of our information out of. Our module version is going to be in here. The GUID that defines our actual module will be here. You can use the commandlet new dash GUID in order to get a new GUID to put in there. And when you, if you don't specify it, when you run the new module manifest, it will generate one automatically. Author is specified in here as well. The company name, any copyright information, description information, and then here you can actually set what uh, the minimum version of PowerShell that you need to have installed in order to work with this module. So because we are using classes and enumerations in this, I have to use minimum of 5.1. Uh, I'm running this in 5.1 compatibility mode just for to keep everything simple for now, but uh, classes and enumerations work in 7 as well. Uh, you can specify some other things in here. I don't really use them. They're PowerShell host names, versions, stuff like that, eh, .NET frameworks. If you're working with something like that, you may need to specify those things in this area, but it's highly unlikely that you will. Uh, here is where you can specify where there are required modules. Uh, these have to be in the global environment before you can import this module. And so it will actually stop you and say, mm, no can do, uh, cannot load this file, cannot load this module. Right here, this scripts to process is where I specify the class scripts that need to be processed in, before the rest of the scripts run. So this will actually specify all the classes and it'll run first before the PSM1 runs to create all the classes that are used throughout the rest of the module itself. 
And the nice thing is here right after it is the types that need to be processed for those classes. So this is the XML file that actually defines what those IP classes should look like when they're displayed on the screen. You can do format tables, you can do format list specifications, you can hide and do calculations with, that, with this file. We'll get a little bit more into that later. All right, uh, I don't know why there's if you specify it as a types to process or as a format to process, it does not matter. Ignore that I put this in the wrong place. See? Live demos. Bad idea. Always, always, always pre-record your demos. That's okay. Quick fix, and we're done. All right. You can nest other modules within your module as well if you need to reuse another module that you've created or a specific version of a module that is another module you're using. You can nest those modules into here. Uh, I don't do it that way. I just use the required modules. Generally sorts itself out. Uh, here in the functions to export field, uh, this array that is created, this array of strings, is what shows when you do a get module and you look at that commands list this is what shows here so if you don't specify something in this list it won't show in your get command and then some people may find it hard to find your your commandlets uh, but you can also leave it out of here so that you can have a private function if you want uh, it's not fully private but it keeps people from seeing them uh, by default, commandlets to export is blank, variables to export is star, and aliases, aliases to export is blank as well. There's some other information down here. You can put in tags, license URIs, project URIs, all your information for your GitHubs, your public GitHubs, stuff like that into this. And if you are doing uh, your help files online, you can put that information in as well. So this is what you need in your PSD1. Like I said, new module manifest builds this whole entire thing for you, so you don't have to copy and paste out of a previous one. Uh, you just fill it in. This portion here, where the functions to export, uh, this is you're going to have to manually put that information in. So if you add a new script in, you need to put that into this list, that command line, if you want it to be discoverable. Uh, like I said, the next thing is the PSM1. That PSM1 is a standard file. Like I said, you can stick all your functions into it, all your, your commandlets, aliases, everything, all your classes and enums into it if you want. Um, I have found a very short and simple way to offload into that scripts folder that I create. Uh, and that is this here, where we go through and we go get all the functions out of the scripts folder, and then we run through each function, importing it using a .import full name. This allows it to pull, pull them all in, and uh, like I said, it allows for that separation of the files so you can work through each file as you go. Now, the nice thing about this is this never needs to be changed. You set this once, and you forget about it. Uh, it will go through and it will always work. You create a new file, it will automatically load all the new files for you. Uh, the next important thing, of course, is your script files themselves. So this is working off of, I wanted to deal with some uh, subnet masking and some deal things like that. And so I built some functions that work with IP addresses. And I'm not gonna go into super amounts of detail, about the functions themselves but what this function was set up to do was to take an ip address using either a subnet mask specified with it or a cider address specified it or cider notation number specified with it and turn it into an object that of ip address type that could be used for other things so when you run this commandlet uh, I'm going to go ahead and import the module real quick. PSIP tools force. I always force it. I don't know why. Um, actually, I do know why. It's because it unloads everything else and then reloads the whole module for you. A verbose goes in and just, you know, spits out stuff to the screen. And, of course, live demo. Yay. 
go back and switch that thing that I changed in the PSD because apparently it did not like it. <laughs> so we'll just switch that back. There we go. See? Live demo. There we go! Now we have it in. Okay, so now I can go ahead and run my IP address commandlet. 15. And I made this in a way that while we're doing this, um, I built three, two different parameter sets, and then of course there's a default parameter set. But these two other parameter sets, parameter sets are not required, so uh, neither of them are mandatory true. So I can actually just create a new IP address. <laughs> and see, once again, you're doing a demo and all of a sudden everything just breaks. Um, it should actually allow you to do that, but it is being a pain tonight. So we will just do it the other way. We'll just put in a subnet mask. So this has actually created an object of type IP, uh, uh, PSIP address, different kind of address than the one that's way down the cryptography network line, if you've ever been down there. Uh, where we have our IP address, it's automatically calculated our CIDR address for us. It has our subnet mask, it's calculated our gateway, and it's calculated our network address for us. So all of those things are actually part of this uh, class that I've built. And that class is easy to share with these, these pieces. Uh, I haven't built any methods on the class, but you can build methods onto that class. And once again, it's easier to share that way in this module. You have it all wrapped together and ready to go. You can test this out and play with, you know, different addresses. Say, put this in, you know, 192.168.7.15 and change the subnet mask. And you'll see all the information lines up and calculates all this. Because I've built this as my own module, I can control the way that the output looks. So by default, I've put it out as a power as a format list. And I have hidden a bunch of information from the user. And a bunch of that information, if you format list this out with a star, you will notice there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. Because I have full control over this class because of the module itself. I can separate out all this other information. And this goes into our class file. So our actual class file that's been created for this is a big old class of our IP address. Each octet is separated out. And you can make these hidden, right? You make these hidden. The IP address as binary is in here. The subnet mask, each subnet mask octet, the binary for the subnet mask, which then helps you calculate the CIDR and vice versa. And then the gateway, the gateway octets, the gateway binary, the network, the network octets, blah, 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 all the rest. And then here, we've actually made specialized constructors that make the rest of the object itself. So we take in the IP address. We say, cool, that's the IP address. We've already checked it on our new IP address object to make sure that it matches the actual correct IP address format. It's, you know, between 255.255.255.255 and 0, .0, .0, 0, 0.0.0.0. Uh, and then here we have it split down all the octets, and then it actually is using another file within this module. It's using another script within this module to take the IP address and turn it into a binary string for us. And that's possible because of this module, right? We have decided that these two functions need to work together and we can wrap it all together and say, aha, you can't run this one without this one. They should work together. We've also created the separate um, uh, constructor for when we specify the IP address and a subnet mask, which is what we did previously. Like I said, this is just, you could do this with just a regular class, but we've done it with a module and we've done it with two functions to do all the rest of it. Uh, but we, we, you could do all this together. Uh, we do our nice band operations on all of our octets to make sure that we get the correct uh, information there. And then we also have a constructor that handles if you provide a CIDR address, because not only does this support subnet mask, I can put in 
Oh, that's under mask. Type it right. I can put in my CIDR address and get the same information. I can get the subnet mask and so on and so forth. Doing the binary math is always a pain in the neck, so it's much easier to have it do it for you. But this, this IP class covers how to do all of that work and create this nice little output. And now I can do this, I can loop around this module and loop around a new IP address, creating these objects, outputting this object information, and you know, converting things from like one subnet to another. I was gonna create something that would actually do that for you, but um, <laughs> it's been a little crazy of a day. The other thing about the classes is like I said, I'm controlling this output. So I am getting an IP address, a CIDR, a subnet mask, the gateway, the network. But like I said, all this other information's here. We've hidden all that other information from the user by using a class format. And so this information here still allows the user to get access to that information if they need it. You can still dot source to it. You can still, as I said, you can format list it, star, shows everything. But by default, in this, for this type of PSIP address, the standard members, if you will, and it's a long story, uh, it's default parameters that will show our IP address, CIDR, subnet mask, network, and gateway. And it will show them in a format list. You can go in here and you can set up a format table view. You can sp set up specific views so that you have uh, one view that shows just the IP address and the subnet mask, or you can have one view that shows just the gateway and the network address. Who knows? The possibilities are limitless. And like I said, this leverages a completely different command that's within the module as well. But because it knows about it, you can go in here and you could use this commandlet on your own. This is a, a public, uh, oops, type correctly. This is a public uh, function so that it can be used by anyone. I can use it right now. It doesn't just have to be used by the module itself. So I just pop in what I want, I get my string back, and that is my binary. Really quick, really easy. If you want, you can write help functions at the top of all of these, and they become built in. Uh, I know they're getting rid of that in 7, but that is there for you. But being able to control the output of what a user sees when they're using your module can be very helpful, because you may not want them to see they may get a little uh, overwhelmed by seeing, oh, here's all the binaries for all the different subnet masks and the network binaries, and why are you separating out all the octets? This is me being over the top <laughs> in my calculations, but I like to have this information. So if I wanted to go through, and for some reason I needed to say, oh, well, you know, I want to move something from network to network. Now what I could do is I have free access to the binary of the IP address, and now I can say, ah, okay, you know, let me move it from point A to A sub one over on a different subnet by just saying, call that binary, adjust the two together, you know, take the network portion of the new address and slap it in on the network portion of the old address, and voila, you've moved it from one subnet to another completely easily on its own. So those are some of the benefits of using a module to work with your users. Uh, these modules are really easy to transition around to different people. So I made myself a little, and this is where it's gonna really break. Uh, I made myself a PowerShell repository on my own machine. So, uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, and I forgot what it's called. So, please hold while I remember. <laughs> oh, wrong ones. Um, yeah, of course. Repository. Don't ever make it on your own machine. Put it on an NTFS per, uh, share somewhere. 
So, uh, we have, of course, the PS Gallery, and I have my own repo, which is on my C temp drive. Don't do that. It's bad. Alright, and I'm going to go ahead and publish, using the path command or, uh, parameter, because of the way it's built as a full entire module. Doing it as path mo uh, parameter will actually allow me to publish the whole thing all in one swoop without having to do any weird jumping through hoops. And we're going to put it in, I can't believe I did it this way, <laughs> my repo. And I don't have NuGet installed because it's my home machine and I don't do it. There we go. Okay. So now it should be posted. Uh, and repository. Oh, God, I can't put this myself. All right, cool. Now I have version 1.1 of the PowerShell module on the repo. I can say, oh, great, I got this module. Let's install the module. Uh, I'm going to do a scope as myself, current user. Yes, I trust myself. I don't know why. But now, if I do a get module, uh, PSIP tools list all available, now I have version 1 on my machine. And I did it for my current user, but if you do it for your all users, then you can actually push it out to, as an admin. You can push it out to everyone on the device all at once. You put it in the public PowerShell path, and you can do that. And the nice bit about this is it is really easy to now make a change. So if I go into this new IP address and I say, put in a nice right verbose line because I forgot to put in one. User. All right, cool. I made a change. Your GitHub will freak out. Your GitHub will go, there's a change. And you'll know you need to make an update. Well, now I made an update. I know that I'm going to go version this up by, you know, whatever your versioning scheme is. Now I've got this version that needs to be updated up to the uh, up to the repository. If I go back and I say publish the module again, we get our nice handy dandy little menu, and we still see. Mm -hmm. And now we see in our repository, we now see 1.01 .01 is available in the repository. Now, you can just send out an email to all of your team and say, oh, hey, you know, please download the newest version and just type a update module, PSAP tools. And automatically, it's going to, of course, ask you if you want to trust it. You might want to trust your own repo. <laughs> But now, when I go and I get modules on my own machine, I have both versions of the module in place. So now, I can actually say, okay, go test out the new version. It will automatically use the latest version by default. So go use the latest version, go see if something's right, if something's wrong with it. And if something ends up being wrong with it, I can wipe out the new version of it, go fix it, update that newer version, and then have everyone re-update back to the newest version of the module without having to pass around a flash drive or email something around, changing zip file name or file names and things like that, and uh, all that mess. So this is a lot easier to, tra to transition the file to someone else. And like I said, it's a lot better in versioning because you're able to say, okay, which version of the module do you have installed? Do you have 1.0.1? Nope. Oh, it's up on the it's up on the repository. Go get it. Don't uh, don't call me until you've got the right one. So yeah. Uh, and once again, you can specify other modules in this if you need to. So if you're using something like the Azure AD tools, uh, Azure AD module, you can specify that in. And those users have to have that module in order to run things correctly. And they know. And it'll warn them. It'll go, hey, big red letters. Well, yellow letters. <laughs> He'll go, hey, you don't have the right modules installed to do this. You need these. So that is my little talk on creating a module. Let me know if you have any feedback, and I'm going to put this up on GitHub so that you all can uh, go and take a look at 
the base of a module file. Have a great day.